All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Event Trader here. Going to be joined by Brett Manning shortly. Brett, you there? Yeah, sure am. How are you doing today? Doing pretty good. How about you, Gab? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Just uh, kind of keeping an eye out on things here. Uh, real quick, while I got you on, there's the China Global Times editor tweeting, current atmosphere between China and the U.S. is not good. What I have learned about China's stance now is holding constructive and positive attitude towards upcoming China-U.S. summit, but fully preparing for its failure and an escalating trade war. Well, that's completely so, different from everything we've heard. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> so so th th definitely hitting some originality here. Uh, we were talking about this earlier, and uh, we could break into it a little bit, but uh, there's going to be a lot of he said, she said's going around. Now, the China Global yeah. Times is certainly, obviously, a mouthpiece from... Uh, for the Chinese government, as is most of the press over there. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what kind of headlines we're seeing from them. But it definitely looks like they're trying to lower the bar a little bit on this side and uh, putting the onus, I would say, probably a little bit on the U.S. ahead of those talks. Well, I mean, the, the China message has been very clear since we had the whole falling out. They just continue to say that, you know, they're basically – They've completely acclimated to the idea that this is an indefinite trade war and an escalation to infinite tariffs on infinite items wouldn't hurt them in the least. And that's the message that they've sent. And I think that that's a typical negotiating tactic, you know, basically saying, you know, I, you know, essentially the same thing that a lawyers at a, 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 a process of trying to solve something before going to trial and, and having somebody, a mediator in between, they both sit at the table and they say, you know, I'd love trial. I'm perfectly happy to walk away from this table. And that's just, you know, that's going to be the message that we get because terms hang in the balance. I would say the thing that is, uh, I'm kind of um, fascinated by is that the Chinese economic data has been better on, on the headline. I, I, I would think with the amount of control that they have over there that they'd You're be fascinated by that. That, that, that that'd be posting – better economic data reports to kind of show like, hey, nothing, nothing's Oh, oh yeah, nothing. no, I agree. Yeah, I thought you were saying the opposite, but yeah, completely agree. They have an office there that in Beijing that is essentially the office of making up the Chinese economic data. Yeah. And I would I would imagine, yeah. I would Same think guy that, that would makes up Kim Jong-il's uh, golf scores and stuff. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he, shot a, he shot an 18. It's pretty, it's pretty strong. But yeah, no, I, exactly right. Like, I, I, I am surprised that they haven't pulled that lever more because they – are uniquely in position to put out economic data that can't really be uh, verified very easily. It's certainly certain data points that they can put out that really, you know, there there's no real checks and balances against that. And that would be a lever they could pull. And they maybe maybe to preserve that as ammunition, they can then fire down the road. Because I guess if they do that repeatedly, then obviously everybody just starts to stop looking at their data. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, maybe maybe they're kind of saving that up for when they think it's most valuable. Okay, well, we'll get uh, deep into the G20 in a second here. Um, just quick, uh, Scott is out of his shop long. Uh, he's following up, I think, at a four-point risk. He got in around 317, so it looks like he's getting stopped out for that four-point loss. Just noting that he's exiting this morning's long. His price acts poorly in a descending triangle pattern. I'll pull that up for you here. Um, Brett, I don't know if you have an interest in... Hold on a second... commenting on anything on the pattern here but um, as you can see it's been one of the stronger names looks like a little bit of um, profit taking going on here so anyway Brett yeah. last week we were talking we'll pick up from where we left off at the uh, in last week's sentiment and flow show and then we can kind of discuss a little what went on over the course of the week and see if anything's really changed from there but uh, a lot of our conversation Monday was talking about the positioning in the markets and the idea that there was a little bit of a bubbling sentiment underneath the surface that uh, wasn't really being shown in a lot of the headlines because there was a wall of worry out there. But Wait, slow down. So, so by, I just want to clarify, by bubbling sentiment, you don't mean the sentiment that is often seen in a bubble. You mean the sentiment that could give rise to a bubble because it's so opposite of a bubble sentiment. Correct, the latter. The uh, the, the turtle reference, or the uh, frog reference, I suppose, would be for you, right? Where uh, the right. water slowly it could, 
right, slowly yeah. leading up to boil in. I, I, I always talked with you through analogies. I, I know you appreciate them. I love but, it. Um, yeah, so when, when I'm saying bubbling, I'm not saying a bubble being formed, but uh, just a, a little bit of percolation of potential money coming in because we had seen uh, that wall of worry out there that was keeping money on the sidelines. We were seeing an uh, overly hedged retail aspect. We saw the, the uh, Lobo, the, the uh, long onlys come in a little bit more on that to really show that institutional was getting a little less cautious out there. And I felt like we were pretty much right on with what we were looking at because we did see that run up late uh, that started early Tuesday morning ahead of the Fed and uh, the Fed sentiment obviously kept us going there. Now we are hitting a little bit more of a flatter pattern over the last couple of sessions. You know, we got that last spike following the Fed, and uh, we've been pretty much going sideways for Thursday, Friday, and Monday. I would think a lot of the, this has to do with waiting to see what happens at the G20. But from my perspective, Brett, I didn't really see a ton change out there from the sentiment side from the last time we were talking in terms of still seeing a lot of potential money out there that could be put into play and a wall of worry still in in action and some things that are pointing towards potential upside of course this g20 remains a big outlier uh have you seen any major changes in the sentiment picture from the last time we were talking no i haven't i think that um it's uh very similar to what we saw if i were to point out one indicator that suggests that it it, it is it is materially still a situation where um, you could be seeing right now, for instance, today, if you look at the tape today, it's it's a very interesting pattern. Uh, we have... Which uh, tape are you looking at in particular? I'll I mean, you can pull you up any index. I think the NASDAQ... You've been the NASDAQ today. I'll pull up I think the NQs is the most pointed. Um, as far as the kind of setting up a, a, an overnight kind of sloped line of resistance, forming a higher low earlier, and then plotting out a very bullish kind of intraday ascending triangle. And when you kind of triggered it, it just was an enormous counterpunch of selling orders to really maintain the structure of that pattern without letting it start to snowball into a squeeze. And, um, and you know, you can look at that one of two ways. You can see that as, um, you know, that that's a distribution. It's a lead blanket offer. It's big money wanting to exit this market because of the big rally that we've seen on shaky fundamental grounds. And that's one way to look at it. Um, and you've got you know, uh, dumb money coming pouring in on the momentum. And if you're bearish right now, that's probably what's happening in your mind as you watch those orders go through. You're seeing the tape composition model that represents, oh, everybody's way too bullish relative to the fundamental situation. And you're seeing the big, smart money just sit on the offer and soak this up. And then the market gradually rolls over. That's that's one viable way to look at things. And if you're, if you're not familiar with the sentiment data, that's maybe what you'd think. But coming from the perspective of seeing that over the last few months, we've seen essentially the largest movement of outflows among uh, active money managers out of equities into this period. And that if you look at um, the hedge fund exposure index, which is really just a, tracking the correlation between uh, hedge fund benchmark indices and the SPX. And, and what you can do when you do that is kind of see if the correlation goes up, over time, uh, then you can see pretty plainly that there's a lot of exposure on the long side of the market by hedge funds. And if, if, if that correlation ratio goes down, you can see that hedge funds are becoming less correlated to the S&P, which means up moves in the S&P may actually be hurting uh, hedge funds on average, which would suggest that hedge funds are largely short. So you can see in that correlation what tests over time to be a reasonable way of, of getting a sense of how hedge funds are positioned as a group. And what we've seen since the lows of June 3rd is hedge fund correlation with the SPX has gone down. So um, they have not jumped onto this bandwagon. And for the larger money managers, the long only, equity only, we know that they were at, we saw that the, the, the largest six month outflows ever coming into that low. So. We know that there's all that sideline cash. So it's really tough for me to see this as a situation where what you're watching in resistance at that point is just distribution from too many big hands being too crowded and long. And it makes more sense to me, especially given the Dallas Fed data we got this morning, which matches up with the zoo surveys, which matches up with the Philly Fed and the Empire. And 
the Morgan Stanley Business Activity Index that are all pointing to just this off a cliff kind of thing that we're seeing right now in terms of how business investment and spending is going. This suggests to me more likely that that's a, a an increasingly enlarging uh, hedge fund short position that's coming in defi defining those highs. And so there is the possibility of a further squeeze if they're not, not able to, to, to kind of shake the uh, the, the overripe fruit off the tree by coming in there. And we've got Powell tomorrow. And it all adds up to me, like I still kind of feel like what we're seeing right now is is an effortful attempt to roll this over into a pullback against what is still just kind of a gradual faucet of money coming into the market that's going to eventually lead to a test and maybe a break above 3,000 without a significant pullback. That could be very wrong. But that's just, if you pair up the sentiment data scene with the type of action that we're seeing underneath the surface of the tape today, that's where my bias is at this point. I haven't seen anything to necessarily contradict that. But I get it. You know, there's a fundamental backdrop that's deteriorating markedly. And ultimately, that may end up being the most important thing. But people are already kind of positioned for that. So we'll just have to see. Yeah, I mean, I mean that it is funny that you mentioned that. Just some of the differences that we're seeing, because when you look at uh, some of the business surveys, definitely caution the further you go out. Um, but there is signs that everything's still performing well. And, but then when you start looking at um, these fund manager surveys, you know, you just have things falling off a cliff, like you're saying. The just like at the BOFA fund manager survey it was the most bearish survey of investor confidence since the global fund financial crisis. Yeah. Uh, the, the equity had the second largest drop in equity allocation ever, which really and we rallied after it. And we rallied after it. Which, so I mean, that's the point: is do you are they able to stick to their guns in the face of just getting deeper and deeper behind on a comparative basis? Maybe there's strength in numbers. Maybe it's like when they see that and they realize everybody else is so far off the benchmark too that they're not in a lot of job jeopardy because it's common to be trailing. Maybe this is going to end up being like one of those years where we start seeing a Bloomberg article, like you know, uh, money managers performed uh, underperformed. The benchmark by the greatest amount ever or something on average. Well, I, I, when you were going that route, I thought you might have been going someplace else, but I did see that there's a Barron's uh, Dow 30,000 article over the weekend. So th things like Well, I've seen a lot of the opposite, too. I saw that when I commented on a Friday about Bloomberg kind of cherry picking several analysts and just saying, you know, analysts look at the situation and say that it's too late to buy the market. You've missed it. It's going down or something like that. So I think we've kind of seen a. A mix of that sort of thing, but yeah, I didn't see the Barrons one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we got a Dow thirty thousand, huh? Dow thirty thousand, and it seems like every time something like that comes out, people start. Oh yeah, it's, they've got an amazing start thing. circling the wagons. But um, when when we're looking at this uh, the sentiment data out there, Brett, the one thing that was sticking out to me was so they have sixty. Uh, I think it's eighty two different, or no, sixty two different indicators they have, right? Who who? Um, for the for the sentiment exactly. trader, okay. Um, right. So uh, you, you know, we you you basically have your sets that you follow. Um, yeah. None of them were showing extreme pessimism or bullishness for stocks. There, twenty seven percent or seventeen total did show optimism for uh, or extreme optimism or bearishness for stocks. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, there's one thing you've got to understand: the it, the the index that I made of 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 a subgroup of those are the ones that specifically exclude market behavior related inputs. And I would I would venture to guess that the ones that are showing extreme optimism right now are I including market activity, which means the market has gone up. So fast, it's got to pull back, essentially. And there are a number of indicators that he has that include um, how the market has performed. It makes assumptions such as if the market goes up dramatically, then it must be that people are very bullish. So I try to exclude all of the ones that have that underlying mechanical bias and just look at things that show how people feel about the market regardless of what the market has done. Right, but well, I guess the point that I was going to be making on this was that uh, we we've definitely had a little bit of a whip in terms of that investor sentiment towards a more extreme optimism side. I, I feel like two three weeks ago when we were looking at this, um, we could have probably said uh, the extreme pessimism side was uh, 
winning out there. So I just thought it was pretty impressive to see that sort of a whip around. But to build off of your um, talk, the w w one um, item that I was seeing was we got back to fi uh, 52 week highs, 12 sessions after testing the 50 day moving average. On average, a test of the 50 day moving average, there's needs to be 34 sessions before the markets can uh, get back to um, testing the highs. Now, what struck me as uh, interesting about that was that um, the markets tended to continue to rally after that. So I, I guess it builds into that idea that you're just talking about where we're seeing some of the sentiment get a little bit more, more pessimistic on the idea. Obviously, you got the wall of worry with all the Iran and G20 and trade wars and all that out there. But um, it, it just seems like a lot of it, too, is, well, we've come too far too fast. And that's, that seems to be the wrong bet most of the time. Yeah. I mean, well, it, I think distinctly, the reason why I've been trading this with a long bias, and, I, you know, I can shift on a dime if I start to see the wrong sort of thing going on. But the reason why I've kept that is because the larger time frame context is so much of a preparedness for the downside, you know, and that usually to me, like some of the best trades that I had in equities were in, in uh, after essentially Brexit in 2016 um, and coming out of those lows from early 2016 and, and looking at that period um, because it was it was so extraordinary how certain uh, the professional money manager class was that the cycle was over. You know that was the period when when crude oil crashed and we came through the first Fed hike. There was an, just an extraordinary, and we got negative interest rates at you know seventy something percent of the global curve, and there was just this extraordinary certainty. That, that was it, and you're crazy if you're putting new money to work in this market. And there was so much hedging. There was just uh, there was just this incredible sense of, I think I told you that something like 80 consecutive weeks had well under the long-term average in terms of bullishness on AAII through that period from the August 2015 crash until, like, Brexit, um, and, and, and even after that. And the, the just that sense that everybody was just so battened down, they were so in their bunkers, and the market was, you know, within a short rally of highs. And that's just, it, it's always something to me that I, I really have a tough time feeling like the market's got downside vulnerability when people are already battened down and things haven't really shifted. And now it's, it's still unquestionably possible that you could just see cyclical economic deterioration that's dramatic enough that you get a new tranche of untouchable money that starts to become touchable and then just flows out of the market. It really isn't kind of counted in this normal sense of, of slightly, not fast money, but slightly faster money than very long-term entrenched money that starts to become vulnerable. The super strong hands start to become not so strong, and that just goes out of the market. That's possible, but at this point, right now, it's a situation where the market is pressing new all-time highs, and you've got a lot of people who, if this market continues to rally, and then there's something, I don't know what, and I don't know how, but just something about the longer-term fundamental picture that starts to show a glimmer of more promise, then they're not prepared for that. And that's the vulnerability to me, and that's kind of why I have an easier time betting on that direction at this point just based on what people are prepared for and expecting and therefore what they're vulnerable to that wouldn't be that unreasonable to start to, to imagine happening. So, I mean, I still kind of think we're, we're in that situation, but it really depends on what I see happen um, and, and, you know, what we're looking at in terms of underlying fundamental deterioration. One of the points I made on Friday that I think is, is pretty important if you're looking at kind of the whole picture, fundamentals plus sentiment plus technical plus everything, um, is I think that people kind of wonder how fast the Fed would take back the rate cuts if it puts them in. And I think that that's one of the things that really could kind of stoke this sort of bubble sense is, is as you, if you've got this bearish view of things, and, and it's not unreasonable, um, it, if you start to realize, oh, the Fed cuts 50 basis points, let's say, in July, we're not going to get a trade deal at G20, um, then, you know, how vulnerable is that to getting taken back? And given the inflation picture, I think that they would need to see, and I think we talked about this, something like well over 2% inflation for a sustained period of time before they yeah, even Yeah, I, I think they're fully on board um, with the price even, even if there's a trade deal. Even if we then, you know, neck the week after they cut, if there's a trade deal between the U.S. and China, 
I don't think there's any chance they would just come out and hike. It could be a year and a half later. And you kind of get sort of another have your cake and eat it too situation at that point. Yeah. With people unexposed to the market. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, from some of the sentiment data we were seeing last week, uh, that would that would suggest that nobody's really positioned for that. Uh, we, we talked a little bit before we got on about the PMI number um, coming in with its, its weakest expansion for business activity in three years. A lot of that driven down lower by the, um, what you may call it, by the uh, forward-looking outlooks and uh, what what people are looking at for the next 6 to 12 events. We saw on Monday to start off the week, business activity uh, having its sharpest downturn in I think it was six years uh, where it fell. It was the largest monthly decline on record actually falling. I think it was 28 points. This was the empire. Uh, Philly Fed on Thursday also seeing a pretty weak outlook there. So the Dallas today, did you see that? I did not see the Dallas one today. That, that had a drop off too, which obviously yeah. encompasses a lot of the energy, um, a, a lot of the energy, uh, uh, which we call utility plays in that region. So uh, we're, we're definitely seeing people brace for it, and we, we see that in the drop off in equity exposure. So I completely agree. That is the pain trade, like we were talking about last week. It still remains in place. Um, and I guess the question is, Brett. What do you think out of the G20 could potentially launch us higher? Like, I, I mean, would it be something as simple as they're still talking or that uh, – do you think that the U.S. would have to delay the implementation of tariffs or do you think that they need a deal in order to get people rolling on this? I think that – okay, let's just imagine that I'm Trump, okay? Yeah. Like, how do I get – both a China trade deal and a Fed cut, because that would be the needle to thread. You know, right, I, right. I, and, I, and, I and, be, and that would be dragging. Well, go on. Oh, I can't be too optimistic out of G20. No, or I don't get the Fed cut. Right, and but I need to leave open the possibility, in fact, if not in in rhetoric. So I suppose that it seems to paint a picture. And I, you know, personally, again, I don't believe there will be a deal. So I, everything I just said before, like, I'm still committed to the idea that it seems to me like getting any – unless there's a caving on principles, then I don't think that there could be – there's not going to be a – let's what I call a light Heiserian deal between the two countries. I don't think there's any chance of that anytime soon. But if there's a caving on principles, you know, if there's, if there's finding a way to construct a different deal that, that people are willing to take, I would think that um, – you're not going to get your Fed cut if it's clear that that's on the way ahead of the July meeting, most likely, especially with the market at all-time highs, unemployment at all-time lows. And most of – and I think the people on the Fed know you – know, most of what we've seen in deterioration in the economic data point has to do with um, business investment and spending based on uncertainty because of the trade picture. So if you suddenly point to, hey, here comes a solution headed right here, you know, you're going to start to very quickly get the Fed funds futures to really reverse ground probably pretty dramatically. So – I think that um, coming out of G20, it seems to me likely that we will get a very tough set of rhetoric following G20 and nothing. Like the the, the type of optimism would be that over the long term, this is all going to work out. But certainly we're going to need to keep playing hardball for now. And, you know, we're getting ready to put those extra tariffs on. Maybe they don't put them on, but the the messaging is that we're going to do that real soon, vaguely stated. And just kind of get us through the July Fed meeting get the 50 basis points cut, and then maybe try to get serious about getting something done. So I guess that, that would be my guess. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that would make a lot of sense. I, I guess the curiosity for me is what we're going to see from uh, the economic data, of course, over the next couple of weeks, and if that continues to deteriorate, we definitely looks like hiring slowed down, so that should work its way into the jobs report, which I believe is next week. Uh I need to double check that because with the Fourth of July, I don't know if that's turning anything that's point. Uh, t- turning anything upside down here. Because uh, I know what markets have a half day on the Thursday, and then or a half day on the Wednesday, and then they're closed on the Thursday. So uh, let's do a quick check on that because that's obviously going to be playing in a big role here. Um, yes. 
July 5th. Yeah, it is July 5th for the, for the jobs data. So that will be, that still will be on. And that's going to be interesting because I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of people taking off that Friday just to get a nice run of a, you know, a four and a half day work uh, weekend. So um, th- that's going to be one of the more interesting uh, items to keep an eye out on. Yeah, but, especially if there's a really harsh rhetoric out of G20, you know, that sense. Although that wouldn't really affect this number, I suppose. It wouldn't, it wouldn't affect that number. That's already going to be in the books. From but That's already in the books of what we've seen with these other data points. And, and the businesses that are accounting for such a drop off a cliff of business activity and investment, how much new hiring are they really doing right now? Yeah, well, I mean, we'll probably see that in the challenge of job cuts and um, the ADP a little bit. I know they're firing folks, but I think that they're probably not going to, you know, start that new plant with all those new hires or whatever. Yeah, but I mean, they, they could be uh, scaling back too. I mean, you know, if they're closing up shops in a number in China or something along those lines, you're seeing a lot of people moving their businesses out from that region into different areas. So I would assume that all comes out in the challenger job cuts if they are laying people off along those lines. So I, that, that's going to be one of the more interesting aspects. I still think that the Q2 earnings season – which will kick off a week after that on July 12th with uh, J.P. Morgan and, C- and B- Wells Fargo and PNC. Are gonna, you know, that's when we're really going to get a pretty fair idea of the impact from these tariffs. Uh, we do have Micron and FedEx later on in the week. So I think everybody's got their focus on the G20, but I really think it's the individual corporates and the earnings that are going to have the biggest impact on sentiment here. Well, wouldn't you think – so here – yeah, that's a big question for me too. So I, I guess the question is if there is this situation where let's say there could in theory – I mean if you believe that there could be a trade deal before too long and you also get the Fed cut and the trade deal, the market could be effectively – and one of the reasons why we may see such a strong market right now is because the market may be willing to sort of look past Q2 earnings. Right. You know, and say, well, this is reflective of an environment that really doesn't necessarily characterize what we're going to see over a rolling four to six quarter average of results, because this is uniquely where we have this massive uncertainty that could be taken off the table before too long. And yeah, could and, be- and we've definitely seen that time and time again, where the market, yeah. it, it, I mean, I mean the, the market's rarely ever chasing the economy. I mean, when it does, that's when you see the biggest corrections or biggest rallies. But for the most part, the market's a couple of months in front of the economic data. So, um, yeah, from that right. perspective. When the economic data is shaped by political negotiation, the outcome which cannot, cannot possibly be known, it kind of confounds that, it, that exactly. discounting mechanism. Exactly, and, and and we've certainly seen that in the market. The fact that those factors are so easily reversed because nobody's gone anywhere, despite this wall of worry. Right. So, um, but and 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 then it, it comes back to the hedging. But people aren't as well hedged as they had been. So, I mean, there is still that aspect that we could see some downside momentum, particularly around some negative headlines around the G20. So, if the G20 comes out. And we do see Trump coming out and uh, saying that, you know, there might be a deal on the table, but, you know, China's got to do some work. We're going to slap the tariffs on at some point. We haven't decided when and all that. Um, The market likely would pull back on that, I would think. Would that be just a great buy the dip moment, do you feel? All all things being equal, just, you know, we... um, not not getting too much into the charts. If we just saw like those headlines come out and Monday came in and there was just the S and P was down forty five fifty points coming down to that fifty day moving average. Uh, the Nasdaq was down two hundred points. Is that something that you think you would be buying? So I think absolutely. I think the way if it, if it looks to me if I just get a if if I just smell sniff out a sense of oh, this is Trump just putting the nail in the coffin on a big Fed cut. And, you know, we re- really wants to make sure that the Fed understands that the G20 just didn't move the needle. It, oh, it didn't work out. And that then, you know, he could just come right back after he gets those 50 basis points taken off the Fed funds rate and start to promote new progress on things. I think the market would also sniff that out. I think you'd have a sharp knee jerk to the downside, and I think that I would probably want to buy that. All right, so we'll we'll continue to monitor this and uh, the sentiment data. Obviously, that all falls 
into that line, but uh, what are you going to be looking at in the meantime in that run up to it, Brett? Is there is there anything you're keeping an eye out on? Any speakers or um, or anything on the charts that you're looking at? Run up to the G20? Yeah. Um, no, I mean I think that you know I, I I have to believe that it's going to be reactive and probably not necessarily significant because I wouldn't think there's a tremendous amount of large expectations built in to the tape right now. Maybe I'm, I, I mean, I could very well be wrong with that, with that uh, assumption, but uh, my assumption would be that there's not a lot of expectations built into the tape, which is why I would want to, in a situation where we get a, a sharp knee jerk pullback out take of, advantage of that. Uh, starting to hit. Yeah. I mean, I would think that that would be something to take advantage of, particularly given the, you know, the longer term big money positioning we were just discussing. Um, let, 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 let me ask you then on the flip side, then, um, we get, uh, which I think is the best case scenario for the market, that uh, cordial commentary, Trump, uh, Trump decides to delay any tariffs, and we rally on that. So are you looking to fade that, or does that fall? Yeah, fall I mean, if there's in? nothing concrete, then I think you'd still be looking at a Fed cut. So Yeah. Yeah, I, I would not be looking probably to fade that. Given the positioning, it just kind of takes the fades away from me. You know, I mean, that's the problem. It's like I, I'm forced to pursue a bias – because that's the vulnerability in the market. Right. It is the upside. It, it just, it just is. And you know, until we see, fruit. until we see something where there's clear evidence that you've got just if you go thirty thousand foot in your mind, is this a market where everybody's really gung ho about how we're really taking off and this is just a nice smooth great opportunity for investors and you know uh, you got you got big money positioned. 100% supporting this market to the upside. You've got retail investors excited about it. And, you know, I, to me, it's just like we're a million miles away from that feel. And yet we've got the market at all-time highs, unemployment at all-time lows, and the Fed about to cut. And it's just how do I short when people are kind of locked into this this sense of, you know, how bad things are, and yet all of those things are true. And the exposure is there. So it's just very difficult for me to fade that market at this point. But, you know, actions would would change that. If I just kind of started to see uh, a, a, a market that starts to act in a way that doesn't match with that set of assumptions, I will just question myself instantly. Like if the tape just starts to not match up with, with the, the scenario that I've built into my own mind and, and the filters that are no doubt there for everybody, including myself, in terms of how I perceive order flow, like, you know, the, that house of cards will come crashing down and I'll realize that I'm just on the wrong side of it. And I will start to really, you know, reinterpret things. But so far, that's not happening at all. I see a market that can easily interpret it as people really coming in and trying to top pick in a situation where the fundamentals don't justify the rally we've seen. And there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of, you know, loose money packed into the market that I can see. Um, so it just, it just kind of so far that house of cards remains standing and, 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 and the, that kind of chooses my bias for me. And I think that out of G20, if we get bullish headlines, but not in the direction that would take that cut off the table and the market starts to rally on that, particularly if it's not overly spiky, then I think that it's just the beginning of the process of trying to essentially flat squeeze in the rest of that money that's sitting there stubbornly, you know, trying to, trying to wait this out. So, yeah. All right. Let me, let me ask you about the dollar then, Brett. Uh, we've seen pretty much every asset class rally here. We got equities and bonds both rallying hand in hand, which uh, t generally bodes well for the market. But um, one that has not been r running is the dollar. Certainly, the Fed playing a role in that. We are seeing the 200-day uh, moving average for the dollar. Has been rising for uh, over a year now. It's one of the longest streaks that we've seen in it f since the 1970s. But now we are seeing it kind of roll back under that 200-day moving average. Uh, I know you got that gold long. Obviously, that's playing well into that. But is there anything that you're keeping an eye out on here for the dollar that you think could? Um, be a game changer for the overall markets. Obviously, one of the most crowded trades for the last um, six, seven surveys, I would say, mm -hmm. for the uh, fund manager survey, probably even longer at this point. But uh, you got any read in on that dollar? I know you were uh, afraid of trying to short the euro because of a squeeze, and that's certainly playing mm -hmm. out. But uh, dollar thoughts. So basically, um, I think that until 
uh, May, really until the China thing broke down and until we started to see this deterioration. I think that there was a whole lot of people who were really on board with what I call the divergence scenario. And that just means essentially that United States uh, economic, financial, uh, monetary policy prospects are diverging from ROW or rest of world. And there, you know, they're, they're, and because the dollar is the uh, reserve currency of choice around the world, that's you know particularly important and can lead to a kind of squeezing dynamic if there's not some kind of joint action by central banks to get together and make sure to prevent that. And I think that that is something that does happen. Um, and I don't think that we necessarily hear about it in detail, but uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that is something that does happen. Um, and, you know, I think that right now we've gone from that divergent scenario to a convergent scenario, and there was a lot of money positioned for extending divergence, for a continued breakout, and even maybe a, a real runaway breakout in the dollar, and that that could be one of the things that fuels a kind of deterioration, and particularly in things like dollar-denominated debt, um, and you see credit spreads widening and, and all, all sorts of, of, of things that would be particularly difficult to deal with. So we have this kind of shift in um, uh, uh, positioning around the dollar now, especially with what the Fed just did, and that, yeah, that's squeezing the life out of the euro right now. We had a big short position there, and that is obviously coming out pretty dramatically. The euro is actually above its own 200-day average now, which hasn't happened in a long time either. So... There's a shift there, um, and we'll see if it gets to the point where suddenly, you know, there's huge bearishness in the dollar, huge bullishness in things like the euro. In other words, huge bets shifting all the way around to really see convergence taking off, um, and maybe the technicals stop matching that, and maybe this really is just a correction in the continued dollar trend. But right now, I think that we've shifted from divergence to convergence as a basic paradigm. Now, a correction from what you'd be going off of monthly? chart here yeah. basically yeah right well or yeah come. like weekly like really longer term sure. where we're seeing a, a big intense shakeout as the fed pivots that then leads to you know let's say you get the trade deal you get the fed does 50 basis points and then signals it's pausing and then we continue to see economic deterioration outside of the united states you know you can kind of see business investment really pick back up and you know in effect what we see with all these surveys becomes like pent-up investment you can see a burst back the other direction if you start to get headway on a trade deal with China, right? I mean, yep. you, all the hiring they were going to be doing in June, they didn't. And so you get these really dire numbers, and then all that hiring starts to happen in August and September. We're past the difficult earnings results, and you get you know big bets coming back and swinging back in with the divergence idea, which I think is is not a, not a ridiculous uh, uh, scenario to look for. But I think... For now, we're you know testing the idea of an extended period of convergence. Right. So we got the convergence theme working. That's obviously leading to a weaker dollar. Now there were a number of other central banks out last week, of course, too. Um, that uh, unless you're the uh, Norges Bank, um, everybody else is looking to kind of scramble to the bottom. I guess the U.S. just is a little bit further to go. So. Uh, that that convergence uh, works in favor of the U.S. from that aspect, but one asset class that does benefit from this race to zero would be gold. You are, of course, long gold. Uh, the GLD and uh, I believe the August contract too, right? The futures, yeah. The, in the futures. So, uh, what's your plan at this point with gold as we see that? Well, so. I mean, the, you know, one of the one of the points that I track is the CFTC data to check the sentiment on gold, and we are underneath um, the net large speculator long position that we saw really in in any of the recent highs. We're basically similar to the kind of speculator position we saw in early 2018 at the test of 1360, but we are way below where we were in, in mid-2016, which is a more similar environment when you look at interest rate markets and recession odds. Um, now you're talking about which question. holders now at this point? Large large speculator holders in CFTC data. Okay. So the thing that I use as a swing factor, I don't like to Now, now you're gold. saying short then, right? Because I saw 42% of the open interest in gold was not short. Okay, long. Okay. Well, yeah, no, I'm. I'm. There's, you know, there's like two hundred and four thousand contracts held net long right now among okay. large speculators. So uh, we got to well over three hundred thousand net long back in 2016 at lower prices. So this is a bullish divergence 
according to that. In other words, if we were to, let's say, if you imagine that there's a kind of, and there's not, but let's imagine that there's a kind of, you know, ceiling in terms of the amount of money that can flow in on a speculative basis into gold, and this would suggest something like another 100,000 contracts could come in and be bought and tip in that direction, and of course that would push it to higher prices, and maybe you get that at 1,500. So just as a thought experiment, it kind of opens up the upside for further movement. It's not a crowded long now, according to recent last few years history, in terms of what it's meant to be crowded on the long side in gold. It's not there now. So I'm perfectly comfortable letting it continue to extend. Um, one of the points that I've been looking for as a test point is really back in uh, mid-2013. We saw about 1435. I'd like to see it blow through that level. Um, and maybe touch 14, or, yeah, so 1435 and maybe touch 1450 as a target for really what constitutes what I would call the order cascade of this breakout. So it's a big ascending triangle breakout, and the order cascade is really once it's definitively above the multi-year resistance level for that pattern, then there's a cascade of orders which constitutes people who've been betting against it, giving up, and people who haven't been thinking about it, but now they see the momentum jumping in, people who've wanted to be long but were worried about resistance jumping in. So all of that transition of orders. Uh, just is is a cascade. It's a process. It's it's just a a, a a feedback loop, and eventually that peters out. And then you start to have to say, is this going to be a trend? Now that we've gotten past the reaction to the breakout, are we going to then see a constructive pattern, a constructive consolidation, and a trending gradual movement higher as we're you know doing something real with that market? And I honestly I do not know the answer to that. I think it depends. I think it's not necessarily a deterministic universe. So um, I, I would think, though, we are going to probably get my outside target, which is when I would take off the last of the futures long um, and and then maintain the position in GLD and see where it can go with the idea that, you know, I wouldn't hold it indefinitely. If it starts to act wrong, I'll take profits on that. But it's been a, a, a spectacular trade. Yeah, yeah, no, very nice on that. Um, another commodity uh, attached to the dollar, of course, that you've had nice success in oil. So uh, let's briefly touch upon that with the Iran issues going on. Obviously, we had a big pop in oil over the last couple of sessions there. A lot of that focused around the Iran issues and the idea that 10% of the world's global supply could be bottlenecked up there. Um, are you taking advantage of these headlines to reload on the short, or are you uh, prepared to just kind of step to the sidelines at the moment? Well, I mean, we're coming into OPEC, too, and yeah. so the two combined. Did, does did that get that delayed? I thought I saw something. Oh, two did weeks it? Ago. I, I didn't see it. I thought I saw that it did. I, so I thought I'd it was going to be very, very early it. July. Um, I thought originally it was like supposed to be June 22nd, then it got uh, bounced Well, there back, was an um, OPEC wrong. meeting, but then the OPEC Plus meeting is what I was interested okay. in. Okay. So they kind of do – it's like a two-step. So, yeah, OPEC, non-OPEC together July 1st and 2nd, which is what I had been assuming. So we're, we're you know, within a week we're going to be dealing with that. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think that it's likely it's going to be just what they've telegraphed, but, um, you know, there's this tiny possibility that – Russian, Russia is getting a lot of heat from its major producers, and their whole system is kind of worried about, you know, what do you really do? How do you position for not losing market share um, to, to the U.S. shale producers who just step in and world production stays the same even though they're cutting? You know, it's that frustration that we saw out of uh, the Saudis we talked about last week back in 2014 and 15. So, you know, I think it's not impossible. You get a little surprised there, but I, I, I really kind of doubt it. I, I just think I want to get past um, I want to get past that, and then yeah, I would love to, I would love to short oil, you know, above maybe fifty-eight. Yeah, and look for it to retest fifty. Yeah, it really seems that Fourth of July week is going to be pretty interesting, given yes, it does. What should be low volume, um, but a lot of big events that uh, might might upset a lot of people who aren't going to be able to get out to the Hamptons and stuff. I think. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Um, okay, Brett, are, is there anything that we're missing here at this uh, juncture? I know there's always going to be something we could chat about, but uh, is there anything that you wanted to add on before we break off this discussion? No, I mean, I guess, you know, there's going to be uh, episodes of the show where we, where we basically are forced to say, yeah, you know, it's pretty much what we talked about last week. The big difference between this week and last week is that the price of things have dramatically changed. Yeah. But... Um, from anything that I can see, the, same. 
the sentiment around them hasn't really changed very much. And in fact, as I said, a little bit, a little bit more, I would say, little, uh, across bit, the whole, yeah. a little bit more optimistic, I would say. A little but, bit more, but, but, but not again, enough the, to upset the apple cart. No, but and again, I want to point out just the the hedge fund correlation with the SPX, the HFRX SPX correlation has actually dropped in that time, and that's a daily update data point. So. Just, you know, I don't know, for whatever that means, it, it suggests that at least one major component of capital in this market is not chasing this bounce, is not malpositioning, you know, is instead continuing to bet against it. And, and, and that may be, it is possible that, you know, there was a shift into the lows where it was the opposite direction. It's possible that it's just there's some big hedge funds that took a lot of big long positions and they're banking them now. That's possible. So, but it, it's not the sort of. There's nothing out there that is suddenly shifting to exuberance. Not, as I always say, if there's a if there's a a big banner heading to this show, the most important number one axiom, the biggest principle, it's that sentiment data doesn't matter when it's not at extremes. It's yeah. not an important input. It really isn't. And when it's at extremes, it matters a lot, maybe more than anything else. And we saw extremes of bearishness a couple weeks ago. Um, and we haven't seen the opposite extremes, and that's where we are, and there's no real read beyond that, and you just kind of have to make a lot of inferences, and my inference is the extremes are such big long-term data points. There's such big processes that have happened over the course of several months in terms of movement in the bonds, in terms of inverting the yield curve, in terms of all-time record outflows from equities among major fund managers, et cetera, et cetera, and all kind of related to this continuing drama that we see now showing up in economic sentiment indicators that is possible for it to go away, and yet there's at the same time the possibility that the Fed uh, opens up monetary policy in a way that's not going to be taken back. And that opens up a big vulnerability to a continued bull market to the upside. And that's where positioning suggests right now, and I don't think anything's changed in the last week that should really change that view. So really it's just about making updated reads on an intraday basis and trying to, to take advantage of setups that are consonant with that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and that's what we're going to be looking for. Um, let, me, let me ask you this, Brett. I mean, do you also view the fact that we're up here – with uh, some of the sentiment readings we've gotten with positioning, that uh, there's a pocket that could really be brutally attacked to to the downside. Where? How does that vulnerability appear to you? Well, uh, well just in terms of that, perhaps this is a lot of over leveraged money that could get un unwound pretty quickly, given the idea that so many people are on the sidelines and so many people have left the markets. I mean, the, I, I always see. For instance, when I'm looking at the 13 Fs with Scott, one of the patterns that I've seen is when you see one stock that gets sold a lot, um, you tend to take a look at in, in a in a quarter, and of course it's a little bit older data. Then they come in and have their next earnings report, and if they miss, that stock gets crushed. The idea being for me that the stock price is able to somehow, you know, levitate above at a certain area where you just have a lot more weaker hands holding it and it just a, a ability for a lot of people to step to the sidelines a lot quicker for and therefore for the uh -huh. price action to get a little bit more volatile. Let me reframe that idea for you in terms of how I would recharacterize the same thing. I think that this, the key to seeing that kind of thing would be if the bigger money that we see in, for instance, the uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch fund manager survey and the Lobo ratio, that, that side of the market – Right. If that side of the market is 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 super strong-handed flat, in other words, it doesn't matter how, what the market does, it's not coming in, and that would suggest that whatever it is that's driving this market higher is building an air pocket underneath it because that's an invincibly flat perspective. See right. what I'm saying? And, 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 it's never yeah. gonna, It's not chasing. It's never. It can't be convinced to chase. So the further up we go, it's just building up. Uh, an, you know, uh, uh, an increasingly high fall because there's nothing substantive that's ever going to come in underneath it. Right, and, and exactly. And I guess that's the point that I was trying to make there. Uh, you know, you see moves like that. Do, do you think that that's in the cards at all? I mean, obviously, so the, there's a percentage of that that's possible. But And yeah. I, I'm still leaning long on from the sentiment side. But um, do you see a scenario where that could play out? So that, that's kind of why I said um, 
if I see behavior that doesn't match with the scenario that I've built in my mind, I will change my mind. Right. You know, it, it's it's if I see the market start to behave at all that way, like it shouldn't what, be possible. What would be a sign for that? That the G20 goes great and we just can't rally off of it. Would would that be kind of like a red flag that you'd be looking for? Maybe or maybe um, really not very bad news. A little knee jerk to the downside, and then it hits a level and it just plunges through it. You know, something yeah. where. I just can't explain the behavior by what's just happened, even though the market clearly seems to be reacting to something that's just happened. And that would start to expose to me, oh, there's just, there's nothing but air underneath this tape. And that's, I mean, that's certainly possible. You know, I mean, if you have a, if you have a situation, let's say, no matter whether there's a deal with China, we're heading into recession. This market is going to be in trouble. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't matter what the sentiment is. Like, if we are really rolling into a, major downturn in the economy, then, you know, all this just goes out the window. You'll see the market behave that way. And um, and that that would suggest, yeah, that, that, you know, there's such a level of commitment to money that's sitting on the sidelines now um, that there's just, you know, there's there's not going to be that, that trailing bid under any circumstances. But, you know, I, again, I, I, right now the reason why I have the view that I have is because it's kind of like we noted earlier, and it's kind of like what we saw maybe in, I think it was maybe the beginning of 2014, where we, you remember those terrible winter storms that we had? Remember that? In 2014? Was, yeah, there was really bad economic data, and there was this there was this just insane weather period yeah. for, you know, January and February. And according to everything now in retrospect still, it really looks like, there was it was such a difficult weather period that there was a lot of investment business investment that didn't happen in well, that there, period there, and was, it became a pent up force. There's been like a four or five year run with the Q1 data, no, I know, but I know, I know I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Everybody but even if you do even if you do seasonal adjustments, it still sticks out. Right. And and it was a it was a you know it was a thunderous Q2 in response, um, and why the Fed turned around in the summer. And that's when they turned around. That's when the dollar rally took off. Right. But that that period was, you know, it was there was a genuine process of pent up investment. There was a lot of things that people wanted to do, and they just didn't pull the trigger for a while. And it looked like we were seeing a downturn in the economy, but it really was kind of like a, a building up a prepotency. And if this is, if this, it, I could see this being cycle end situation. But if this is people really pulling back on business investment because they're really uncertain about G20 and about what we're going to see in the path ahead, then it's not impossible to see that this could be the same sort of thing. And after a 50 basis point Fed cut, and with everybody with money on the sidelines, and I can't kind of get away from that view a little bit. I'm fully willing to start turning around. You know me. I'm ready to start shorting this market sure. whenever it wants to be shorted, <laughs> and it just doesn't. It doesn't feel like it wants to be. So. I'm trying to be responsible here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, I, I agree. So so we see a downside potential, but uh, obviously you got to be, still be leaning long here given the positioning, given the sentiment data, and um, given the fact that we have been climbing a swall of worries. So I think we're going to end it there, Brett, unless you got anything else you want to add before, as a part no, of the show. All right. Uh, we will be uh, posting this shortly. So uh, please feel free to take a uh, re-listen to. And if anybody's got any questions on anything, write in a feedback and we'll gladly address them. All right. Take care, right, guys. Right. You take care, too. I'll talk to you soon. Okay.